Hey everyone, welcome to the stream. My name is Wes McDermott. I'm Integrations uh, Product Manager with Algorithmic, and today I am thrilled to say that I have with me Mark Foreman. Mark recently created a set of 15 highly detailed assets for our Substance Source Signature Series. And in this webinar, Mark will give us an in-depth walkthrough of his medieval Tudor brick substance material. So Mark, I just want to thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to know, uh, can you just please share a little bit about yourself and what you do on a daily basis? Sure, uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm Mark. Currently, I'm at the CD Project Red. I am a senior environment artist. Um, I spend most of my days working on environment art as well as materials. Um, uh, I, I started out in the, the modding scene um, for Half-Life 2. Um, working on a few small projects before joining the guys on the Black Mesa team. Yeah. All right, that's awesome. Thanks, Mark. And so, uh, you know, before we jump into your actual walk around, I just had a, just a, maybe a few questions I'd like to ask you. So, uh, like I said, we, we are going to be looking at uh, a specific material from, uh, from your medieval series. And uh, so one of the things I, I was just curious, like, uh, why did you choose uh, medieval as the theme for this series? Uh, so right now, a lot of the stuff I've been working on, sort of both at work and at home, has been uh, sort of sci-fi related, science fiction, and, and from that sort of area. And uh, I've got quite an interest in, in, in medieval stuff. So I thought, you know, taking this opportunity to create a, a set of materials, um, it, it made sense to do something a bit different to what I had been doing. Uh, previously and well, recently, yeah. Oh, that, that's awesome! And uh, again, we're thrilled that uh, you were able to uh, have the 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 time to uh, work on the signature series uh, for us. And uh, yeah, I got to say, I mean, the the content really speaks for itself. It's it's actually quite amazing. Uh, so, kind of going through it, um, you also had mentioned that you had decided to. Uh, you know, take all the content and break it up into three subgroups. Um, so, why did you decide to kind of do it that way? Um, for me, I thought uh, I came at this approaching it from a, a game art point of view. And I didn't want to create a set of materials that could make one thing. So, you know, I could have made a set of materials aimed specifically at a castle, for example, and, and you'd have a cool set to make a castle. And, and But a medieval world contains sort of more than just castles, although, you know, they're, they're the most iconic thing. So I wanted to be able to create a set of materials that you could use as a springboard and, you know, maybe make a village and a town, you know, as well as a castle, ruins, sort of hopefully give you enough, enough space to play with them without making them too, too specific, you know. So, yeah. Um, and then within that, like, I was focusing on not just, um, again, being able to make one thing, like, the whole set should work together. You know, you could put all of them in a castle. There's nothing to stop you doing that. Yeah, very, very cool. Uh, so uh, one other thing before we get started is uh, I'm actually going to jump over here to uh, Substance Source. Uh, so let me just do a quick screen share here and present this to everyone. Um, okay, so one of the things I just kind of wanted to mention to everyone who's who's watching today's stream is that, uh, you know, we have Substance Source, which is a, a, a vast uh, online la library of PBR materials. And uh, we recently just started the process of reworking uh, the the UI and the UX for Substance Source. So one of the things you'll see here is uh, we have a lot of Mark's uh, beautiful materials on display, uh, but we also have this new uh, kind of thumbnail for all the materials. So this is uh, kind of the f the start of the kind of the first version of this new iteration of Source that we're working on. So we're starting to see this here. As always, we'd love to get everyone's feedback. So uh, you, you know, just let us know in the comments or talk to us on the forums of anything else you'd like us to do. Uh, another thing that's pretty cool about Substance Source, uh, we'll look at this one here. This is the medieval Tudor brick uh, that Mark's going to be working on. And so you can see that we have the maps. Uh, but we've also added this new uh, Substance Player. This is our web version of Substance Player. So for example, here you can see that uh, I can load up Mark's material. And then here on the right, I have all these parameters. So this is all the parameters that Mark exposed as part of this material. And uh, I can tweak and interact with these. So for example, I'll try this uh, one of these presets that Mark created. This is the, the red and white preset here. Uh, or I'll go by the or I'll try to change this 4x4 four four, uh, tan. 
And so you can see that uh, this new substance player allows you to just interactively work with all these parameters. You can get an idea of what the substance looked like. So this, uh, this new substance uh, web player is, is also new to source. All right, so uh, let me just stop my screen share here. And uh, Mark, so at this stage, uh, I'm just going to, uh, you know, pass the mic over to you, let you screenshot and uh, walk us through uh, your material. Sure. Okay, right. Uh, let's get that going. All right. Um, here we go. So uh, I think a good thing to, to start with is just a quick, like, I'll do an overview of the whole graph, uh, explain what's going on, and then we can, can step through it from there. So like I've got my graph split between um, uh, height map, and then over here is sort of finishing it off. Uh, I think this stuff here is the, the diffuse and the, and the roughness. Um, I start like all my, my materials working through the height map to, uh, to the straight to the normal map usually. I don't do a whole lot after the normal map, I just sort of let that that uh, let the height map drive that without adding too much extra information afterwards. So in this material, um, inspired by uh, Tudor walls, Tudor architecture, so they have a lot of uh, quite cool brick patterns, and then of course timber frames. And uh, so, Mark, also, I'll just let everybody know that uh, this this material, uh, actually, could you uh, show the material in the 3D view um, oh, yeah. as we're going? Yeah. So I'll just let everybody know that's watching is this uh, the material that Mark's uh, kind of walking us through. This is actually free as well on Substance Source. So uh, you, you can download this. Uh, the SBS package is free. So you can open it in Designer, take a look, uh, you know, as well at, at your own leisure. Yeah. And so, uh, Mark, one thing I wanted to ask you before you jump right into everything node by node here um, is, um, so right before you start like a project like this, or we'll say this particular material, do, do you usually start, like, how, how, do you start with reference? Do you gather your own reference? Uh, how does that work? Um, it sort of depends, material to material. Um, quite a lot of the time, I, I don't sort of start from reference. Often I, I start with an idea. Um, and see what I can come up with. And then if I get stuck, I might go and, and, and find some solutions from some reference. Um, for this one, yeah, like I, I was, uh, when I planned to, to start this set, I had a, a collection of images I'd actually taken recently, um, you know, a couple of years ago now, actually, uh, on a trip to a museum in the UK, um, sort of nearby in my parents' house, there's this open air museum um, full of recreations and um, some sort of real world uh, medieval architecture. So I had a, a nice catalog of photographs that I could dig into. And so I think this one came from, from one of them. There was a, a building with this sort of interesting brick pattern in the timber frame, of course. So. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So you actually, you know, get to, you know, some of this is uh, conspired for some, from some actual kind of real world locations. Yeah. 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 A lot, I mean, a lot of the, uh, I mean, pretty much all of this set, you know, I wanted it to, to be realistic and such, like it's not too fantasy, um, but you know it, it, you can embellish it however you want. All right, so yeah, like um, let's start, I guess. Yeah, and and speaking of that start, I know this is a question that that we do get asked a lot, and so I, and I would be interested in asking you this question as well. Sure. So speaking of starting. When you look at something like this, a, a complex material, like how how do you start? Because you know it could be you know pretty complex material you're getting ready to create, and it seems like a you know oh I could do I could go this way I could go that way. Like for you, Mark Foreman, like how do you start a material? Do you just start playing around, or or how does it work for you? So there are I guess there's two criteria that really dictate where I start. One is which bit of the material is going to take up the largest surface area. Um, so in, in this case, I did start with the bricks because I knew it, it is essentially a brick wall. And, and most of the pixels on the texture you output from this in like a, you know, a default preset is bricks. And so I wanted to make sure that that was going to work and was going to look good uh, before I added the timber frame. Um, another thing that, that drives what I decide uh, I might start with is 
uh, like a layered material. So again, that sort of applies here. The bricks are under the timber. So I, I started with the bricks. Or for example, like on uh, a, a cliff covered in plants, the, I know that the shape of the cliff is going to dictate the, the layout and the shape of the plants. So in, you know, I'll start with the cliff there. OK, I see. Yeah, so like, you know, speaking of the bricks, uh, that seems like a pretty good place to start. Um, so I wanted to do the, the herringbone pattern, or the chevrons, or the, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it sort of evolved a little bit from, from where I started. Um, and I knew I wanted it to be, you know, with all these materials, I really wanted to, to push the, the parameters and the, the options that you would have uh, downloading them, if, even if you didn't want to dig into the SPS files and just use the SPSRs. Uh, I wanted to make sure that they were going to be you know, nice and flexible. So I had to come up with you know, everything so that you could change, like you can change the, the number of columns on the, the bricks here. If I swap over down here to the brick columns, you, know, you can put that up, and it's going to go through and, and, and update without sort of breaking, you know. Um, so that meant I had to dig into sort of a bit of maths and things, which is something that I haven't really done a huge amount of my materials. A lot of my materials I make, I sort of make the appearance I want, and that's what I'm going to output and work with. Um, so making uh, graphs that were sort of so flexible is a little bit of a new territory for me. Usually. I might have toggles that allow you to have, oh, it's mossy or it's not mossy. But um, not often do I need to go in and, and manually have a graph that you can tweak to, to change the moss levels. So I started uh, with the tile sampler and seeing where I could get uh, the brick pattern out from that. I used gradients to, to create the sort of the angles of the bricks. Um, I'm doing it two bricks at a time. Um, at the moment, I think that's the minimum. Well, you can go you can go one at a time, depending on how many columns you have. So yeah, I guess the first point is, is the bricks. So you've got a parameter that allows you the number of bricks you have per row. Um, so the first parameter, so Three, three different gradients that are all um, mixed randomly. So as you increase the number of bricks, you're going to get uh, differences in the angles. Um, I don't want to jump back and forth between the parameters too much because it, it's a little bit time consuming. But let's put that up. So bricks per row. This is the parameter driving these three tile samplers. I ended up using uh, three separate ones, of course, to get um, variation, just one, uh, then building the rows out of that, because they all have to be stacked so carefully on top of each other, meant that the variation in angles, uh, you know, I wasn't getting that, which is why I'm using three here. But you'll notice I've got the, the resolution on all of these nodes set down so that it keeps the, the computation time down. So once I've got my rows of bricks, the next tile sampler is just there stacking them. Um, again, the only the, the parameters driving this one is the, the column amount and the row amount. And I also have a couple of other, um, this is sort of a, just a copy of, of the, the one from above. But in this one, I'm using uh, just some grayscales. Again, like this is the, the number of bricks per row. And then randomizing the, the output color, I can generate eventually a, a grayscale mask for doing all the colorization and, and depth off the offset and things later. So after creating my rows and my columns of bricks, I needed to put them together. And so to do that, like I can use I use the the color variation. Um, output, clamped it to make a mask. And then with just a little bit of maths in here, taking into account the, the number of columns, um, the number of rows, I've 
uh, this node is is calculating the offset I would need to fill in the the blank space in between. So essentially, it's offsetting it sort of by half of one row, or no, a row and a half. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so setting up all the maps, I was just explaining to Wes beforehand that uh, I, I'm sort of opening it up and it's a bit of a mystery even to me now. So it's it's offsetting it one row and I believe um, rotating it 180 so that the angle is going in the opposite direction. And then this process, you know, uh, once I had it working in one row, it, it was just a case of copying my nodes. They, they copy over with the parameters and setting it up to, to build the other, uh, I guess, masks I'm going to use. The final one was one I added um, towards the end. I really like some Tudor buildings are painted with really cool sort of black and white contrast patterns. And so I wanted to add a little bit of that into one of the presets. So I created this mask using uh, you know, a similar method to, to before, which just creates a pure sort of chevron black and white. So. Another node you're going to see all over the place in this graph uh, is these gradient dynamics, which I'm making use of um, to randomize my random grayscales all over the place. And I'm just doing that by sticking uh, an anisotropic noise in with, uh, you know, which is a nice mix of grayscale values and then the gradient dynamic to just randomly apply them. Uh, so. Here, I, I've done that to take what was uh, sort of the distinct columns from before and just turned it into a, a random mishmash of, uh, of values for the bricks. And then again, um, this one's just mixing in some different intensity to the, to the angles of the bricks. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a really cool way of using the dynamic gradient. I never thought of it like that. That's, that's awesome, Mark. Mm. Actually, like every single... I think almost every single graph in, in this release has it makes a, quite a large use of these. And it's yeah. really useful because, I mean, uh, although this one's not hooked up, like all you need to do, you can expose gradient position and you get a randomized output, essentially. And so, That's awesome. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm you totally going to take this technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I, you know, it's, it's, it's something that <laughs> I've been making more and more use of. Like of every like, working through all these materials, it's like, oh, I can use that here again. And uh, yeah, it, it was quite cool. And again, like it's such a simple thing to expose, like this gradient position, expose it, name it, randomize something. Um, so yeah, there's going to be loads of them. So this is the, the brick shape. And I guess the sensible place to follow on from that is the brick's height. And so in here, I'm first going to separate out the, I don't have um, sort of profile of the bricks, I guess you could say. So I've taken the the, the random uh, gradients and edge detected them, and this is to get like the, the surface, the face of each brick, and then I'm using a, just a distance node to create an angle, a bevel on the outside. Um, and then it's just some, some leveling and clamping to get you know, gaps in between the bricks. Um, it's not super linear graph, so it's a bit tricky to walk through. <laughs> so yeah, this is just um, some noises to create the brick shape. Uh, at this point, um, I mask in my timber frame. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that later. But this was to stop the bricks from interfering too much with the, the layer, layer of mortar I've got along the side of the timber. And after the the rough shape, the, the, the noise of the of the outside of the brick, and then bringing in the uh, you know another great ra ra random uh, randomized gradient to add a slight amount of depth offset to the bricks, and so this is one you can control with the uh, you know with, with a parameter, and, and this just going to give each brick a, r a random depth from it from its neighbor. So after that, I'm doing some extra uh, sort of noises and things to give each brick a slightly less flat surface. So I mean, this is just a simple 
Gaussian noise that I've run for a high pass, again, sort of, you know, using quite a low resolution, keeping everything running smooth. Um, and then I'm warping this by the my my mask, random brick mask from before. And so I'm, I, I like this because like I can combine it with the linear gradients. And it just means that instead of each brick having a sort of a, a mirror flat surface, that there's going to be some that have a slight bulge or a you know, um, concave front. And it's just adding as much sort of variation as I can to, to the brick surface to try and keep it looking sort of natural, not too perfect. So hey, Mark, uh, we had a question that came in uh, here from uh, one of our viewers just asking if, uh, if you had any tips uh, about how to uh, just kind of navigate around in the graph and not get lost. Uh, you know, we have a lot of connections just going every which way, it's not just yeah. in your graph, but in any graph. Like, how do you tackle, you know, organization and not getting lost in your graph? Um, I guess I cheat a little bit because, I mean, I, <laughs> I build the graph and I'm pretty good at building a mental map as I go. Um, and I don't, yeah, so, I don't find myself getting lost in my graphs too much. Even graphs that I, I can open sort of months after I've started. And, and again, I often I lay things out in a very similar method. Um, I, I kind of like you read a book. So I normally start top left and everything works its way, you know, left to right and, and down through the graph. So the height map as you go right is sort of the general flow. And every now and then, like the surface texture is is out of the way there, but I don't really do much more than that. I know there's some tricks and things in in Substance that, that make it quite easy. Um, I quite enjoy now having starting working with the parameters, being able to pick my parameters up here um, and and see which nodes that's driving. Um, I make quite a lot of use of that. Um, just because like you can see here, this, this one parameter is referenced in, in a number of different nodes. And so that was super helpful if I wanted to come back and tweak a parameter and, and know exactly where in my graph I was going to have an effect if I changed that. Yeah, another uh, option that we added in the latest version of Designer, uh, and it's in the toolbar, I can't remember exactly. I remember, uh, oh yeah, it's the it's the button that's next to the uh, the eyeglass. When you select that and it and you select a node, it'll actually uh, select any nodes that are connecting it and dim everything else. So I found that to be kind of helpful. We just added that in the latest version. That's and good, yeah, I think I think that's it. Yeah. Know. Yeah, there you go. See, it'll it'll select and uh, just the that node with its connections and stuff. Um, another tip for, for for anyone watching is that uh, also good to uh, make subgraphs. Like if you find if you have a big set of nodes, like I'll typically just take those and just push them into a subgraph. We have an option where you can just right click on selected nodes, uh, you know, create subgraph out of that. Sometimes that can help. Almost like kind of like merging layers in Photoshop or something. Yeah, subgraphs are handy. Um... I do occasionally make use of them. Certainly, if I'm working on something like vines or, or something, having the leaf in a subgraph is really nice because uh, you can keep it isolated and, 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 you know, like you say, go straight to it. You, you can click on your graph up here and you're editing the leaf. You don't have to remember where it is to navigate it to. Um, but I, like in this series, I didn't make a huge amount of that because I'm doing a lot of noise reuse. So. Oh yeah, that's you know, that's a key for optimization, right? Yeah, a, a lot of the the lines going every which way is is sort of reusing nodes and reusing outputs. Um, so yeah, I mean yeah, like that. So I mean, for wanting to to take materials into like Painter and stuff, uh, it's 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 nice having them as optimal as possible because you get that that quick response. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, like, yeah, and the other thing that was recently added is these these icons, which I really quite like. Um, like, uh, let's turn this off now. Being able to see, ah, oh, like, you know, this is what I'm seeing in the 2D window. Um, sometimes I would, I, I found it a little bit, you know, it's really nice having that, because once you've clicked off to, an, to another node, you, know, you can tell how, how the things are split. Oh yeah, that was in our latest uh, release as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, the team is they're they're aware that uh, especially for people new, uh, looking at uh, you know a, a large node structure, it's uh, it's gonna be very overwhelming. So yeah, we're we're definitely looking at, at new ways that we can help 
you know, make mm -hmm. things more visual, make things easier to read and so on. Yeah. And then of course, like frames. Um, oh, yeah. Good. I'm yeah. really bad at uh, using them. Normally I finish a graph and at the end, I make sure I go through and tidy it up. And, you know, because knowing that you know, I might leave it alone for a few months and then you, you come back to it and, and it's nice to have left it in, a, in a, at least, you know, with these hints of what each section of the graph is really controlling. All right. Um, so, yeah, here, and we got this far. And then, like, this one is just bringing in the, the chevrons from, from, from my pattern later. Um, again, just beveling it to add some some angles for the normal map to pick up because uh, that's quite important like the it also eases on the sort of the stretching you might get on the sides of things having gradients around them uh, when when you're using tessellation and once i've got all of the like at this stage i've got all of the big shapes uh, of the bricks handled and i do a final um, sloper pass just to add some sort of erosion uh, chips to the outside of the bricks. I like doing this in, in a few different places. Like, you know, I did it once on the, the profile of the bricks with, with a slightly higher noise. And then this one afterwards, because um, after having the chevrons in, you'd expect bricks that are raised up would receive more damage than like this brick here that is up has got a chip taken out and the ones below uh, are protected. Hey, Mark, I see that, uh, if I'm reading it right, I think you have the Gaussian noise plugged into that. Do you, is that the noise that you'll typically use to do an erosion when using slope blur, or do you use different noises? I use different noises. I actually use the Gaussian noise quite a lot. Um, you'll see that it's all over the place. I mean, but, but here, because this one is finer, I've gone in there with um, be a black and white spots one. But I've blurred it out a little bit to, to make sure that it doesn't end up too noisy. But yeah, like a, a lot of the time, certainly for bigger shapes, you know, like here, I'm not too worried about having a lot of noise on the profile. So the Gaussian noise does that really nicely. So yeah, just uh, curious, like you're using the Gaussian noise. I think uh, we ended up adding uh, a few versions back. We switched it. We, we created a Perlin noise, which was actually yeah. doing that. And I think we yes. our yeah. old Perlin was Gaussian. So. Yeah. Do you just like the Gaussian noise better, or what? What's your thought on that? Yes, a little bit. Like, yeah, that that switchover, I switched over to the Gaussian noise because um, I was used to it. I, I knew what to expect. If I plug it in, I yeah. know roughly what I'm going to get. And so, you know, a lot of the time I'm working, I, I do that just because it's it's faster, right? You know. And but I also I do like playing around. When we got the, the Perlin noise, so in, in this situation, like it, it's a little more black and white. There's some more values in the, the Gaussian noise. So I would expect the, the result to be a little uh, less even. You know, like where there's a bright white spot, you're going to get um, a bigger chip than when there's the, the darker gray. Whereas here, you're going to get a much more even sort of uh, result across the graph. Yeah, yeah, I see. That's a, yeah, that's a good point. So you know, it's like, yeah, more bricks are, are damaged compared to this, or they're, they're, if they're damaged, they're all damaged, they're sort of the same. So it's just looking for little things like that in the noises normally. Um, I don't think I use the Perlin noise a whole lot, but more because I'm so used to the Gaussian noise. And, and like I say, you saw the way I know what to expect from that. OK. Um, yeah, digging, in, digging through the noises uh, is something that every now and then I force myself to to do something a different way, because that's the, the best way to, to figure out, oh, wait, you know, I'm looking at this now. I quite like the, there's sort of lines of, uh, of information in here. So I'm sure that, you know, um, there'll be, there'll be some time, like, you know, making a mental note of that. In my yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, like this is the, the end of the, big, I guess you could say, brick shape. And now I'm just going to start adding in noises and, and, and details to the brick. So the first pass is some uh, splits that you might get. It's sort of the, the brick will shift it over time. The, the bricks are going to crack. Um, and for this one, I've got another another gradient dynamic. And this one is, is 
driving a mask for for those cracks. So in the the parameters, you can control um, both the randomization of the. It's just thinking of let's do it this way of the cracks amount, and so that's going to be the histogram scan moving up through the mask, so you can sort of crack all of the bricks or, or just a few of them. And then again, like the, the random is just shifting the gradient position so you get a different mix of the grayscale values. Back to the default. All right. Um, and then, yeah, it's just a few different noises mixed about in different ways to, to get some damage. So here I've got um, some erosion to the surface of the bricks. That's just bringing in these small patches of, of, of sort of roughness to them. And uh, so like, you know, a, a bigger pass and then a finer pass with some uh, higher frequency noise that to add these patches again to the surface of the bricks. And then after that, I've got this uh, subframe that's just adding the like the majority of the brick surface texture. So here I was looking at getting um, sort of the patterns you might see in the clay when the brick's been formed, as as you know, like a, a log of clay, I guess, has been cut into brick shapes, and you you get these sort of drag marks, tool marks in the surface, and that is it for the for the bricks themselves and so that's where i started in this graph like you know once i got the bricks down it was moving on to add the mortar in between the bricks and for this i started uh back where i'd grabbed uh, my my mask for the brick themselves so that the gap in between and then why are we rendering change something. Oh, that's right. I've gone to 8K. That's not good. Are you with me when I... <laughs> oh, yeah. No problem. It's just having yeah. to be you now, I guess. <laughs> I did, I did my, my video memory. <laughs> yeah. It's got to sort itself out. Come on. So while that's just recomputing, uh, one thing I'll ask you, Mark, is uh, just kind of reading through your blog post, and you've kind of hinted on this. One of the things you, that you did say was that you found yourself really digging deeper into the power of parameters uh, than any more than you've ever done before. And so, like yeah. you said, I can really see see how that's how you've gone through that process here in this material. Hmm. So, so function graphs um, using those to create parameters that that's. I mean, that's something that you're starting to do more of now, but like you didn't really do it before. Um, yeah. Um, before, like, I, I was using parameters, but like I say, usually it was kind of a switch that would turn off a bit of the graph, and so either I'd have moss over over my brick wall or, or no moss, for example, and I'd be outputting them uh, as presets. Um, but since doing this, I, I am making more use, like building the, the brick pattern. Uh, before, I probably would have built that once and made it work, but without the parameters. And then later, if I decided, ah, you know, actually, I feel like I should have probably put more bricks in, more columns of bricks in. And instead of being able to just shift a parameter because it was all set up, I'd have to go back through and make sure that once I changed one tile sampler uh, node, I then have to manually update the other ones and shift all the pieces back into place again. Um, oh yeah, so I mean, this is what I love about designers so much. It's like uh, it's 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 very much like working in Houdini, where you're making a procedural model. But I mean, here it's like you know, same same process, just a procedural texture. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, Mark, you might you might just right click and and ch and choose compute thumbnail. See if that 
forces I'm everything. Sure. Like I'm, I'm looking at the bar. Here. Oh, it's, it's still like, rendering down there. Okay, I'm sorry, it's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I think. I think. Uh... Oh man, now it's frozen. Mm hmm. Now we can just restart if you like. Maybe just close it out, force quit it, and restart it again. Uh, yeah, I think that looks like it could be a good idea. Right, let's... So yeah, while you're loading that up, Mark, uh, just a few yeah. questions in the in the chat was uh, one of them's uh, any best practices for combining height information and retaining as much info as possible. Like I guess they're asking like what blend modes to use or ways to bring back info when maybe it's sure. gotten crushed. Um. Uh, so like the first one is I try and stay away from like completely black blacks and completely white whites. And trying to keep it uh, closer to, to mid-range gray values gives you more flexibility when it when it comes to choosing your blend modes. Um, you know, like using add linear dodge is going to push you up into to full whites, um, whereas screen does a pretty good job of keeping keeping you away from that. Like it'll go pretty bright, but it's not going to go all the way up to white um, unless you're working with very bright gray values. Oh yeah. Um, and the other thing is like, you know, right from the very beginning, I've got my outputs hooked up for normal height map. And I, I usually have like a curvature off the normal node. So I'm keeping an eye on, on what's going to be the result from the very beginning, uh, which can save in, in like, you know, some surprises where you might go, this looks pretty good in the nodes. And, and now I'm going to properly set up my outputs and, and you end up with a surprise. All right, um, here we go again. I'm going to share. OK. Yeah, so like, uh, where's a good, good way of showing that? So here you can see I've, I'm, I'm making sure that I've, like, here my height map was completely black and white. And I know that because I want to layer some noises on and I want to shift the bricks not just down but also up. In this node, I've then made sure that I've pushed everything back down to within sort of the mid range of the grayscale values. Um, which means, like, once I'm layering on the brick depth, I've got room to play with that. Um, I think a lot of the, the, the blend modes I use is, is sort of multiplying screen. I think a lot of the time, well, here I'm using copy. Um, yeah, multiply. I, I tend to to have a sort of subtractive mindset. So, like for adding this damage, you, you could screen that, but again, like I, I keep sort of consistency in in the way I I treat the nodes because I then know roughly what sort of result I'm going to get. Um, so yeah, lot, lots of uh, multiply and screen. I think of is like the, the two blend modes I use the most for, for combining noises and layering stuff. Um, and then things like max lighten and subtract uh, when I want sort of harsh transitions. Um, like, because um, that's cool, like max lighten adds only the values that are brighter than the base input. Um, like when when I bring the the timber frame in, for example, where does that get combined? Over here, oh, actually here I'm using a height blend, but height blend behaves kind of like a blend node using max light. Um, all right, so going back to the mortar, I've, I've grabbed what was the the uh, the mask I made for the profile of the bricks. And I can. I'm just gonna, you know, invert that in the levels to turn it into uh, a mask. So instead of masking the bricks out and having the gap separate, I now got the gap masked and and, and the bricks hidden. And the, the first thing I do is create a profile for the mortar. 
So there's two ways. Often I go about adding mortar. Um, in this graph, uh, for, for this material, I've, I use, um, I create a, a mortar I like, and then using the non-uniform blur with, with my final mortar to blur where the mortar's gonna go, I then just screen it over the top. Um, I quite like using this when I know that the surface is gonna be pretty uniform. So here, I want mortar around the bricks. Like, you know, it, it's the, the best result for the, for the leaks and things. Sometimes I might use a height blend and then you get mortar that's only going to appear at the same sort of level as the bricks, and you can have bricks that are sticking out proud of the mortar or, or sunken behind it. Um, so yeah, and, and so to get the streaks of the mortar, you just use the uh, what was it non-uniform blur on that? Yeah, yeah, for those guys, where is that happening? Right here, um, somewhere here is the leaks. Oh yeah, so here, so I, like you know, I'm I'm building up a a mask for the mortar. Um, this is the the mortar around the timber frame, and it's just a case uh, like I, I know I'm going to use this both the height and and to mask the mortar into the result, and so it's building up layers of of noises um, to get some unevenness to the mortar itself you know, usual slope burrs and things to add some erosion and, and lumpy detail. And then when it comes to the leaks themselves, yeah, it's a, it's a non-uniform blur node with uh, some mixed about vertical, vertical noise that I'm clamping here. Uh, this is the parameter that controls the number of streaks you have, and it's just doing that by moving the, the black level up, up and down. And so the, the lower you have that black point, the more streaks you're going to end up with. And then just using that as the, the blur map in the non-uniform blur and making use of the anisotropy and the, the, the asymmetry sort of a, a downward direction just to, to create the leaks, which I'm then leveling to bring them back up again. And because the leaks are, are dragged straight down from the height map, I can put them back together with a with a max light, and and then you only get leaks heading sort of uh, you know with gravity, um, and then this mask, this this stuff is masking the leaks so that not every single brick brick has has leaks on them. That's awesome. Yeah, it's something I use like even for, um, like obviously this sort of this is has got certain thickness to it, the leaks here, but in in I'll use it to add dirt. Like I think you can see like there's some some dirt streaks that in my dirt. Oh mark. yeah. And so like this is is something I use quite a lot. Um, either either this way or or sometimes um, let's do that quickly. I might. Um, blend the height map I'm going to use with something noisy. I just use the faithful Gaussian noise. Mm. Like that. And then a slope blur with linear gradient can achieve a similar sort of result. And sometimes I find that this uh, might work a bit better depending on what I'm working on. But they have like their ups and downs, they're, they're different strengths. This, this method can work quite nice if you want to add some, uh, if, if like this was a whole wall of mortar and I wanted some drips on the surface, I might do it this way. Uh, with Zeta Max as well, we get a slightly better lit, uh, drip profile then. Um, but this method's quite nice when I want to combine them back and sort of preserve this flat surface at the top. Um, the slope blur has a tendency to, or like it, it drags it down more. Uh, so, so this method is a little more precise, I, I would say. Um, 
when you've got these sort of fine fine lines and things. Yeah, that 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 one's that one's good. I like that a lot. Um, another question, Mark, uh, pertaining to the mortar. Uh, so the question is, how can I have the mortar and the brick in the same level? Like if I add some damages to the brick, the mortar is showing up in the damaged parts. Um, well, yeah, like I was saying earlier, um, you can do that with, like if you use, if you make a flat layer of mortar, and then you can use height blend um, to mix that with your bricks um, instead of like I could quickly sort of do a proxy for that. Um, just fatten that up a bit. So if I did. Let's see, shift my mask, so that's going to look very different for just a second. Wait, no, that one's not going to work. That is the timber frame. Um, where am I creating more than mask? This one. All right, although there's no noise in this to, to drive the shape of the mortar. Um, so doing it that way, obviously you get, now you have sort of, you can control, like if, if this was a missing brick, you end up with mortar in the recesses. And if you wanted to add more pattern to the mortar around it, I would probably just sort of take the, where should I grab the height map? Um, I want to grab the, the final height map and screen that over. Like, um, it would also need, I could mask the, the lowest level of the brick. And use that to, that way around. That way around. It's a it's a bit noisy because that's very quick. But you see, you can separate the the lower stuff from the higher stuff that way. If I had tidied up my masking, you'd get a better transition. Oh yeah, but. This graph wasn't really sort of, you know, I didn't build it with, with that method in mind because I didn't want to, I'd say, push the damage in the brick in in that sort of direction. So let's swap that back over to where it should be. Um, I mean, the other thing I could have done, I suppose, another way if you wanted to have, you could take this and I guess if you had a or bit something like you know the damage level of the mortar you could add that in back here and then you're, you're sort of getting a kind of this looks more like someone's come in and repaired the wall at a later date like they've filled in the holes with some extra mortar if you see it, yeah, it's, it's not so much like a brick is missing, it's more like, uh, or a brick is missing and has been replaced with mortar. All right. Um, that one. Yeah, that's a cool look too, though. Yeah, it is actually, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it's something that you could quickly go in and uh, tweak. If you wanted to, to grab the graph, you could do that. Just clean up those new nodes I put in. So yeah, I mean, like I just sort of really shown the combining, and like after creating my mortar high map, this is just the usual of, of some some different noises to get that texture in the surface of the of the mortar itself. Um, before, like I say, for this one, I decided to to, to go down the non-uniform 
blur and screamer because I like the way, you know, it, that, that helps you get these sort of nice buildups around the, the objects, like around the timber. Yeah, that looks good. And, uh, and the other benefit to this is it means the leaks stay on the surface of, of the texture. It can get a little tricky if you, you use the other methods. Uh, like, I don't know, if you, if you check that out later, you might see that the leaks kind of disappear and you just end up with the mortar um, around the bricks. There's many, many different ways of sort of, you know, combining this stuff. And it kind of really depends just what you're aiming for, I guess, in the, the final result of the, your material. So yeah, like that. That's um, the end of the the height map for the brick part, which is where I started. So at this point, you know, I wanted to to start with the timber frame, and so sort of going with the the left to right mentality. It's sort of back over to left on the bottom row is the I guess the second half of the height map. So. Again, like for, for the start of, of the timber frame, I knew I wanted to, to have this all exposed in parameters. So I chose to use um, a gradient as the, the kickoff for, for each beam. Like instead of creating the beam first and then arranging them in, in the tile sampler, uh, I started with the gradient. Um, into the tile random, and then afterwards, I've done my clamping to create the beam. And so a reason for doing that is if I'm going to have, uh, like, well, here I've got sort of four vertical beams, I can do all my processing for the beam shape after that on all of them together and, and make them slightly more unique than if I created the height map for a beam and then placed it across the surface of the graph. So for the for these guys, like you know, the the tile random is just con controlled by a parameter which defines how many how many beams there are. You've got the the vertical amount in this row up the top, and the horizontal amount below. And like uh, building this graph, I stuck with with one row first. Um, I can't remember if it was horizontal or vertical, but you know, I, I did the height map for for that bit first. So I did all my warping, blurring, all of the, the sort of profile processing um, on that level, and then copied it to the row beneath. So I saved myself some time that way, instead of sort of doing each bit as I went along. Um, and so in here, I, I start working on, on getting the, the structural elements brought in, like I, I wanted these to, to look like they're built, not just sort of intersecting with each other. So I made use of the, the height map I'm building of, of the beam, the horizontal beams, I decided that they were going to be sort of the main structural ones and the, the vertical ones would be uh, placed on into them. So I'm, I'm creating a, a mask using the, the horizontal beam and the vertical beams together to then turn into what becomes some notches taken out of the horizontal beams. And doing it, the, the same process to, to the vertical ones to get a, a little bit of a bevel profile to the outside. Again, like just so it's picked up nicely in the normal map once you get putting everything together. Like I'm also using uh, a curve node on the, the gradients on the outside of the beams just to give them that sort of uh, a, a bevel instead of having it um, as a, a flat gradient, flat angle, so to speak. And so once I've got the, the shape down, um, I guess, where where's that come from? Yeah, down here, I've got these, the mortise and um, for, for locking in, like this is something that's very typical of, of timber work back before they were using nails and metal. Um, so I, I wanted to include that detail. And these I'm just taking um, from the horizontal beam, uh, using the distance to, to create a gradient um, out from, from the mask of the beam. And then I use a curves node to 
to select the level on, on which these are going to be. Like this was trying to keep it all um, driven from from the beams themselves, because it means when you come in to to parameters, this stuff slides around instead of placing everything with with tile samplers. Where am I? Again? Let's just show that mortar beam. So if I make the the horizontal beam thicker. The, these guys sort of react to that. Um, wow, that's so cool. The same with if you, you know, increase the, the vertical amount because it's all being driven from from these two. It, you know, it's it's quite nice because you can you set it up once, you worry about it, and and then it sort of takes care of itself after that. All right. Yeah, and then it, it's sort of layering in some noises and things like down here. I've created a simple wood grain because the surface area of these guys isn't so huge. I knew it didn't have to be super comp super detailed. Um, so it, it's sort of picking up on the big shapes you, you, you see in wood. Um, it's not just the, the noisy sort of fibrous stuff. So like the underlying structure, like maybe the, the growth lines of the wood. And then I'm just created a tile random full of some gradients of varying thickness and direction and walked that across to get a simple you know wood grain and for the purpose of, of these beams you know it's, it's sort of more than enough um, and, you know mixed with this some um, I believe this is a directional yeah a couple of different direction noises uh, mixed in four and a two to get that the fibrous feeding into it. And so yeah, you know, over here I'm just making sure it's sort of facing in the right direction. Um, so re reusing uh, the, um, oh, this is the step one, like this was getting in some uh, feelings of sort of hand worked wood woodwork, sort of old fashioned tools, scraping the beams to create the shape. And I've taken the the output, so uh, the two. I don't know what I'd call them. The lines I've in here, I've then made a second use of. I've picked them up and turned them into some splits just by using a slope uh, to to push the dark values down um, and a high pass grayscale to isolate them, and then you know mixing them with some more noises uh, and clamping them, and they become the splits. And this is a, a mask just to offset them because it, like, it's not a continuous piece of wood. I knew I wanted to shift it so I didn't have cracks continuing you know, across the surface. And, and this is, again, hooked up to the same parameter for the horizontal beam. So as you increase the number of, of rows of wood, you're going to get a different layout of the cracks. All right, and so then at the end here, I'm just combining the various pieces of the frame. Um, the, the horizontals with the, the mortises, mortise and tenon joints into a whole frame. And then from this, I'm creating the masks, like masking it for the mortar and uh, adding it into the, the height map of the bricks. And so, yeah, that, that's, that's the height map. Um, I think I've covered covered all of that, and that's like I normally push a, a material to this point. Maybe the noises aren't so refined, but it's it's going to look pretty close to this before I I start worrying about the the diffuse. Because if you have the information in the height map, you know you can drive a lot of that. You can use that a lot of that to, to drive the, the base color without having to go back and, and repeat yourself. Um, so, I guess like the the same with the the the, t the way I start the height map again when I move on onto the base color, uh, starting with the bricks again, um, and. Here, it was just a matter of uh, what we got? Um, 
creating some masks that are to, to randomize my layout of brick colors. And so again, I'm starting with a gradient dynamic to randomize the, the layout of, of uh, the main color values. Um, got the chevron pattern coming in here. And then it's just blending in, like they're usually pretty subtle um, because putting it through the, the gradient dynamic, if you have a, a noisy gradient or even a simple gradient, you, it really pulls out um, differences in color value. So it's quite hard to see the, the changes that are happening in my input, but um, that's because I don't want a brick to go through like a full spectrum of color across one surface. I'm really looking at getting just some subtle color differentiation. Um, so I then have like, this is the gradient dynamic that drives the, the main color of the bricks. So I, again, like this is something that I do quite a lot. A lot of my, my material, I, I use gradient dynamics to do the, the, the colorization, especially for natural things like wood and uh, rock. I find it a really handy way to work because I can build these, uh, like you know, I build these color palettes, I guess you would call it. Um, and then you can change your colors in one place and affect many different layers of the material. Um, it's quite a, a quite a handy way instead of uh, using the the height information straight into a gradient node, um, which you might then have to change a number of different gradient nodes. I, I like having these palettes set up. So, like th to make the palette, I've just got my uh, like these are the three color options you get in the graph. So like there's a base color for the brick, which is what drives the, the, the broad color um, across the surface. And I'm just combining that with um, a simple gradient um, clamped from, from black and white values from a gradient linear, just to make sure that there's a, even a bit, there's a bit of color differentiation even in the base color. And after that, I'm combining uh, a couple of uh, the, the variant colors, so like this variant color A and B, um, so that you think that the, of the, the grayscale input, the darkest bricks are going to come out this darkest color, and the lightest bricks will come out the lightest color. And then depending how much you blend um, between the variant colors and the base color, will depend how much you see of the, the base color in the bricks. So if I just go play around with the, the presets here for the brick color, so you have this variance intensity, and that's shifting the, the midpoint on this levels node, so that if I put it all the way to the left, um, the more of the, the base color gets blended in, and you can see the variance of the color goes down. And if I put it all the way to the right, then you get more of the, the gradient from the variant colors. Wow, that's really awesome. Yeah, it's it's uh, like I say, like I, I like doing this because even if I'm not exposing this stuff in parameters, it means I've got this one bit of the graph I can go back to and tweak one color and and see quite a large change in in the material. Um, on on this material, like I'm only actually using this gradient in this this one node, but um, for example, on the stone materials, I like to combine different layers of, of the color noise together to, to get a slightly more natural, like layered look. Um, because what you get out of here is, is like, it's a little bit clean, a little bit sterile. I've also just created a, some different values of, of bricky, bricky colors that I'm then uh, creating a palette a slightly different way from uh, using Again, an anisotropic nose on a gradient dynamic that's just kind of split it up, and you can see like you get different compressions, broadnesses, and you know the colors get really quite cool uh, mixed around, and then combining these in a, a, into another couple of gradient dynamics means that uh, like I mean on, on this this graph it's it's not exposed, but here is somewhere like on a stone material you can then use this and you can 
shift around your your noises depending on the the grayscale input. Like here, I've just got some clouds. You can use this to to change the colors in the like the sediment layers of, of a rock material, for example. And so here I'm now I'm just sort of blending these noises together. Like I say, they, instead of having the output from one, which is very specific, just putting them together up to that chaos level. And, and then this is just overlays over the bricks to, to get some finer variation in the color. And then after that, it's just some, some use of the curvature to, to pick out the edges of like the erosion, for example. Uh, and and some cavity to darken the recesses, and so those steps get repeated more or less the same. Um, like for the timber again, I'm creating a color palette um, for the for the wood to pick out the wood grain. Uh, I do it with this uh, sort of ramp because um, then when I put a low um, low noise gradient in, you get the, the color rings in the wood. And so that's pretty, pretty nice for keeping, like maybe um, not clamping your values too soon. Like you could make this very noisy and then use a very simple gradient, but I, but I prefer it to do it this way around. Because again, like, you know, if I decide, oh, this dark ring is popping up too much in the woods, you can go, go back to this one graph and I don't know what this will change. You see, you can change sort of specific layers of the wood and you've got a little more control over the overall final colors you might see in your, your wood base color. And so here I, I am using different, different layers. So I've got the, the big shapes of the wood and then some, something more noisy. So I can combine that too and it just softens it up. You know, too, too much of this one might end up looking a little bit artificial. And then it's just layering these in, in various ways. I've got, because I got the, the beams in two directions, so both vertical beams and horizontal beams. Um, I've got a, a mask of just the, here it's just the, the, the vertical beams and, and combining them that way to make sure that the wood grain that I that end up in the base color matches up with what's shown in the, the height map. And then, uh, what are we bringing in here? Oh, this is again like just some minor color variation for the for the tenants, so they stand out from the background. Uh, and then it's just bringing in some, yeah, again some some of the the curvature to add a little bit of a, a, a worn, brighter feeling to the outside of the beams pick out some details in the wood grain um, in, in various ways. Again, you know, like I say, once I've got my height map sort of, you know, making use of it as much as possible in the base color, um, because again, I can now go back and change the, the pattern of the wood grain in the height map, and it's going to update in my wood and, and reflect those changes without then having to also go back and make sure that I fit this wood to, to whatever I have in the height map. And so I've jumped ahead of the base color, but you know, then I'm bringing it back in, uh, using the height blends nice because you get this sort of super clean mask out um, to mask that book over the bricks. The mortar is, is sort of even more simple than the brick. Um, I've just taken the the noises that I generated based off uh, the brick pattern and the height map before, and then just tinted it with with the color, um, which is exposed for the mortar, and then a little bit of curvature, soft light in there to bring the three dimensionality out a little bit. And so what I've got uh, after these guys is some grime. Um, so for, for this one, I kept it pretty simple, um, just using the ambient occlusion, um, blending it in with, with a couple of noises. This is to add some slight swipey feel to it. Um, and again, 
like I mentioned earlier, then sort of a layer of leaks to make this wall look like it's been stood outside, you know, it, it's weathered. It's, thinking of the UK, it's been lashed with rain and, and, and what have you. <laughs> All right. And so after that, like the last bit um, is the roughness. Uh, it's normally what I get to last, but um, it's one of the bits I often have the most fun tweaking with because I really like making sure that a material is going to look good even if it's not lit. You, you, this could be in a dark area with, um, and then you want to still have some response. You want to be able to pick out the forms. And so having a, a good roughness is, is quite key to that. And so for this, um, usually I, I start with the curvature because it, the high points of the curvature, like where uh, a wall's been or an object's been rubbed, you expect that to be slightly, like, slightly rougher. And I'm just bringing that down with the levels to where I sort of want it. And then it's just layering on, on some noises, um, bringing in the, the color mask, like so the, the, the different settings you can use react to, to in more than just the, the, the base color. Um, the, the darker bricks here are, are going to be glossier. And then I start adding in, like, you know, I, I've got some scratches in here that I've offset based on the brick pattern so that it looks more like scratches that happened before the wall was built. Um, so the, 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 bricks, the bricks were scratched and then a wall was built out of them. And then just adding some, some fine noise uh, across the surface of the bricks. Like, it's really going to pick it up in here. But just so you get these little, like it could be little grains of sand or silica or something in the, uh, in the clay that the brick was made out of. And for the mortar, I've just sort of taken the levels and clamped them slightly differently and masked that in. And then I believe, yep, this is for the timber. And so again, I'm using a similar process to the diffuse um, where I've got a gradient dynamic. I've got a pretty simple sort of pattern to grab the values from. And then this is just putting some difference into the, like the difference uh, of rings of the tree, the different hardness might have a different um, when it, where it's been worked, it's going to appear slightly glossier or rougher. And then just layering layering those two together um, with the height map with, with this to, to pick out some different rings. And then another gradient to add some broader sort of patches of, of rougher um, surface to the wood. And then masking that together. Um, Again, some scratches for the timber with the bricks underneath. And then the very last thing is just bringing in the, uh, the mask from the dirt uh, and, and layering that in. And so here I decided the, the grime is going to be uh, going to be rougher, rougher than the brick. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's it for, for the nodes themselves, for what the graph's built out of. So, uh, Mark, sorry about that. I'm checking something here. Yeah. So, Mark, we had a, uh, another question that came in from the chat. Was uh, as you're as you're working on your base color, do you just keep an eye on those values uh, to make sure that they don't go too dark or something, or do you use like a like a PBR safe node, or you know, how do you make sure that it stays PBR safe? Yeah, totally. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, one, oh, don't change that again. Um, one thing is, is, yeah, like when I'm setting up values in my color palette, so, you know, I know the, I know roughly where to avoid. Um, you know, I know I don't want to go below 50 and, you know, don't want to go too high above, uh, you know, too, too close to white. Um, so I, I keep, keep the values I start with you know, in, in the ballpark, like the noises I'm adding. Um, again, like, you know, I, 
Each one of these I've picked out, I've made sure it isn't too dark or too light because I know I want to overlay it um, with, with the base colors and, you know, having it sort of 60 and 60 multiplied together, you know, you're going to be too dark. But after that, yeah, I do make use of, of like, you got the, uh, the validate node. So I haven't let myself down here. And so, well, you can, like, there's some, some little pixels here and there and the, the, the very deepest recesses, but you know, like the majority is green and it's just sort of keeping an eye on it as I, as I go along. But yeah, after, actually after the levels, I, I, I've actually <laughs> removed those. It, it's got some adjustments to stop it going too dark. So yeah, it's just keeping, keeping on top of that. And like I say, you know, if you make sure you're working with values that, that aren't too dark at the very beginning, it's going to be more likely that by the time you get to the end, you haven't gone too dark. Yeah. Well, that's incredible, Mark. Uh, I mean, this this material just looks amazing, and like, uh, it's it's been super inspiring to watch you go through this. Like, uh, I pretty much decided that I think I'm going to not make a material again after <laughs> watching you. I mean, I I realize I know nothing about what I'm doing, <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was really uh, that was awesome. Uh, so many cool things that you're doing in there, and. You know, I've been a fan of your stuff for a long time. Like back when, uh, you know, we were talking earlier before the stream started, when you were at the Substance Days in Asia, and you were building out the. Um, it was like a stone temple with the columns, and yeah, it was, it was just amazing, kind of to see your mindset. So, I'm sure everybody here who's been watching uh, definitely has enjoyed uh, just, you know, just seeing how you work, how you come up with the materials, and how you solve different problems. And uh, just again, for everybody, the, this is uh, really just a, a material that's coming from Mark's uh, new signature series that's on that, that's now on Substance Source. This particular material he's been going over, uh, it's called the Medieval Tudor Brick, and it is uh, free. I believe I set the link in the description of this video, but uh, you can go onto Source and download this, uh, this project file for free and view it here in Substance Designer as well. So uh, not really sure there's any other questions that anybody wants to ask. Uh, we can stick around just for a few more moments. Um, let's see here. Um, oh. Just give it just a moment here and see if anybody else comes any questions. Uh, other than that, we'll, we'll probably just conclude. But yeah, again, thanks, Mark. This was, this was really, really awesome to, to see how everything came together. No problem. Thank you for having me. There was a... You know, like uh, say in the beginning, it's a cool project. You know, I had this this reference material sort of just sitting in a drive. Uh, it was really cool to be able to dig into it with a purpose. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So here we've we've got one question. Uh, just someone was just wondering, just on your own self, like, do you have any uh, top people that you learn from, or that that you tend to kind of try to pick up techniques from? Oh, that's uh, good. I guess like any any tutorials you've seen that you've liked or something like that from any other of the professionals. Um, yeah, uh, I keep an, uh, an eye on ArtStation um, for for stuff that pops up. Um, places like um, Polycam or uh, cool, they you know there's a whole algorithmic uh, sub forum there. Um, the community is super great sharing tips and things. The like the, I got started with. Um, the cobblestone tutorial um, on the Nomon workshop. Um, who else? Like Josh Lynch, you know, I, his his stuff on Gumroad. Yeah. Yeah, that's there. There is a, a lot of stuff that's out there. You know, like you yeah. said, you got Josh Lynch, Daniel Tiger, a lot of uh, really great artists. Uh, that are you know putting content out there so yeah anybody's watching uh just you know check gumroad check the you know be active in our forums our discord uh hit us up on twitter we were always everybody uh at algorithmic is very active uh in the social spaces uh just you know we're all artists ourselves and we enjoy using the tools and we love talking with people so uh mark you're also a super friendly guy <laughs> that I, I mean it's always awesome to hang out with you so yeah mark you're another good one to ask questions and things like that 
So um, yeah, it looks like that's that's it. So uh, I'm going to just go ahead and close out this webinar. Uh, again, thanks, Mark, uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for watching. Uh, we have a lot more of these webinars planned. So uh, stay tuned uh, for our newsletter. We uh, or our, also our Twitter account. We'll we'll just kind of let you know ahead of time of when we're going to do another one of these um, webinars. So stay tuned, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching, and we will see you next time. Thank you.